Okay, okay, okay. Good afternoon, good evening, good morning, wherever you are in the world. Um, my name is Honora Boa. Um, this is the first ever of, if hopefully, uh, an ongoing series that we're going to do um, about film, African film, African cinema. Um, with me is my guy, um, Monsieur Leo, Mr. Lionel Ache. Say what's up. Bonjour, bonjour. Good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Yeah, my name is Lionel. Um, long time, long lifelong friend of Tony's. I wouldn't um, go. I wouldn't say life, but okay, long -term. sure, yeah, long, <laughs> long term. Um, you know, uh, like him, we're cinephiles and you know, f fans of film from 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 the continent, also, especially. So it's good to be here. Thank you, thank you. So. Um, Whilst we wait for people to come in, everybody who's just coming in, just say what's up quickly, just so we know who you are. This thing is a little bit early, so if you're not ready, I'm sorry. You can watch it back, or you can join in later. But we're going to be discussing two films today. Uh, the first one is a uh, is is a film which, unless you are a fan of African cinema, particularly Senegalese cinema, you will have no idea what this film is. It's called Tuki Buki. Uh, and uh, it's a it's a fascinating film. It's uh, it's it's unfortunately it's available online to stream for free, which means that they didn't do good deals. But that's neither here nor there. But rather than talk about it, we're going to play uh, a trailer. So shout out to Selamit. Thank you for saying what's up. Everybody else who comes in, please just uh, Nancy. Thank you. Thank you. Please also let us know where you're where you're uh, coming from as well, so we know. But thank you very much. So we're going to play the clip now. I'm sorry. Start from the beginning. Ah, je comprends maintenant. C'est à cause d'un badolo comme toi qu'elle vient toujours en retard en réunion. Attends voir. C'est pour nous moucharder qui t'ont déguisé en cowboy. And there it goes. There we go. So that was the trailer for Tuki Buki. So, Leo, maybe you can. Sorry, I, you know, I don't know what the proper way to should I say Leo or Lionel? Which one do you prefer? Either. Either is fine. Okay. Yeah. All right. So for those of you who weren't who uh who weren't uh here at the very beginning, so me and this guy go back. We grew up together. We're in school together. We also have uh, big traveling history around Africa. So we we are fans of the cinema, both from the continent and from the black world generally. So, Leo, talk to us about this film, just generally. Yeah. So you know, Tokyo Bookie obviously was 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 in was came out in 1973 by a filmmaker called Jibril Diop Mambete. And so he was a Senegalese filmmaker um, who actually, you know, this film was his first film. So he had no training at whatsoever. Um, and he had maybe $30,000 to, to make this film. Um, so unlike, you know, previous African directors like Usman Sembene, who we know as, you know, the, the so-called um, father of African cinema, or even Suleiman Sise from Mali, who had, they all had kind of film training from schools in, in, in the Moscow Film School. I, I think it's called Vijik, right, Tony? I, I don't know if you know the name of that. The, 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 <laughs> yeah. So they had those, those filmmakers had previous experience, but he did not have that. 
And he was someone who, you know, Jibreel Mambete was someone who came up as an actor first, got, got expelled from acting school for misbehavior, and now decided to pick up the camera. Very political person uh, he was growing up, uh, someone who was, you know, had a, you know, a soft side for for the, the poverty stricken within within not only his country Senegal but the wider African continent. So this film took a big came up through that, um, and you know it's a very you know symbolic film. You know very surrealist almost uh, with a lot of beautiful imagery. Um, I think you know you you know Tony. I, I don't know what you feel about the starting scene. You know the starting scene about the the the, the cow in, in a sort of house that is getting you know actually executed. Um, I don't know your thoughts on that, but you know, others, you know, others have this feeling of of it being, you know, Africa within the 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 the, the grasp of its of its colonizer, not, yeah. not being able to escape, um, and that's going to just kind of really tee you up with the the right imagery to show you, you know, his own thought process. I don't know what you think about that first scene that launches you, the film. You, you know, you know. Okay, so just just so you're all aware. The film is, it's made in, it came out in 1973. So as you were saying, uh, it's quite uh, gruesome. Okay, you have to keep, I think we have to put it in the political context of the time. So this is just after this, like, we're in the Cold War, number one. Uh, there's this, like, issues with expression. You start seeing people become more nude in films now. You start seeing the experimental kind of cinema, you know, this, uh, Godard and all these people are trying to, you know, do all sorts of stuff. So it almost seemed like the more extreme you were at the time, the more you stood out, you know? Um, I mean, keep in mind the type of, this is a brisky point. Films like that were coming out around like three or four years before this point. So that opening scene, spoiler alert, people, that opening scene where you see the blood of the cow, and it's not just there, you see blood as a recurring theme right through the film. But that opening scene when they are cutting up <laughs> the cow and you see the blood. But for me, you know, you know, actually the, the part about the, the, the more gory stuff for me was the scene where it, uh, uh, Bambetti puts the girl stripping down naked and like, intercut it with um, intercut it with the 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 cow itself like being cut up so you can see the blood from the cow and then she takes off her clothes and then she goes down and uh, it implies something which by the way interesting story i saw that in a hair salon in nigeria i was watching on my phone in a hair salon the, the what do you call it the girl doing my hair was on top of me hey behind me excuse me so she's so i'm there watching the thing and then she's looking down, and then she's like in complete shock at what she's seeing. And then almost <laughs> within like 30 seconds, she had gone to do someone else's hair. And <laughs> came back and somebody else <laughs> did my own uh... hair. Luckily, luckily, the scene was over. But anyway, yeah. it is, I think that I think I think what they were trying to do was express, you know, reality. You know, the, the truth is we all eat meat, not all of us, but most of us eat meat. And most of us like, most of us also, uh, you know, in this, especially probably more so now, are very PC. We try to be very PC, try to act like, you know, this is wrong, this is wrong, but we'll still eat the meat. But the reality is, okay, something has to die for us to consume that meat and be healthy. You know, so I think there's something powerful in showing that. I don't know if that will be allowed now. Funny enough, it probably wouldn't be allowed now. Yeah. In fact, I'm surprised even because it's a free link on YouTube and there's no like alert to let you know that there's this blood and stuff. I don't know whether yeah. you know it's or not. You know? Yeah, I think, yeah, I think it was just, you know, during the times, something you, like you said, you, you won't see now, 100% no. not. I think the film, like you mentioned, they had this kind of, frenetic cutting of scenes and of audio. And I think people say, you know, that um, Jibril had influences with the French New Wave, like Godard and all these guys who kind of implement this kind of jump cutting of scenes of editing. Um, I I think that I I see his influence more so kind of the Italian neuralism where he, you know, he used a lot of non-professional actors, a lot of on-set moments, you know, you know, impromptu, you know, um, direction. Um, so I think that was, I think for me, the one thing about the film is a lot of symbolism. 
right? So everyone will take from a, diff a different view. Mm -hmm. So what I, what I take from it will be different from what you, Tony, or from someone else who's seen it for the first time, or mm -hmm. for someone else from a different continent, for example. Africans mm -hmm. are supposed to say Europeans or North Americans will, will have a v different view of the film due to mm -hmm. how symbolic it is, all the imagery and the symbolism. And I think that's what, um, you know, Jeep really wanted. And I think you'd be happy with that. Yeah. Because speaking yeah. of people who've seen the film, we've all come, we all will have kind of arrived at different conclusions about what the film means um, and, 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 and the message behind the film. Um, so, yeah, I think, I think for me, if I may expand more on the film is, you know, the one thing about <clears throat> the one theme you see throughout, you know, um, you know, his film, whether it's, you know, his, his earlier short films like Badu Boy mm -hmm. or Contrast or this film is, is this feeling of hybridity, the feeling of, you know, the pre-colonial, you know, African, you know, context, you know, you know, put along with, you know, the, the, the Western colonial, you know, spirits, you know, in, in an African new colonial yeah. context. He, he kind of mixes both together in his films. And I, I you know, if you look, look at interviews, he, he is someone who, um, although he realized the impacts of, of colonization on Africa, he also was not happy with the way that Africans, especially in Senegal, attached themselves to the parent company, if you will, of France. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he didn't like that fact. He was someone who was against that, you know, that attachment, that kind of subservient nature and um i think one scene um there's a scene where you know there's a scene in the film where you know it shows wrestlers fighting on behalf yeah of, yeah, of yeah. trying to get you know a memorial of a former french president and you're trying to you're trying to ask it's actually kind of in a mocking way showing the attachment that you know certain countries had to you know to that so you i see, think yeah yeah yeah, we, 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 you, you, in fact, you've gone deep. There's a lot there, like regarding the symbolism. The sub, look, ultimately, if you, if you were going to describe this film to anybody, you would say it's a mixture between a comedy and a drama. But in reality, it's a political film because what, what's basically happening is this guy is, this is Leopold Senghor, dictator of all, of, no, not dictator of all dictators, but when you talk about African, like strong men without a gun, Leopold Senghor of Senegal, this is his time. Keep in mind, filmmakers around this time from Africa are making movies that are, I wouldn't say similar. And in fact, I wrote an essay on this for my university uh, thesis, which is um, that about when I was talking about, um, uh, what's the Bukinabe filmmaker that just recently died a few years ago? Uh, what's his name? Not sure. Not Kabore. Uh, what's his name? He'll come um, back. He'll come back to me. He'll come back to me. Woo! What's his name? What's his name? What's his name? Anyway, he'll come back to me. But Wadrago, Idrissa Wadrago, excuse me. Okay. Idrissa Wadrago, one of the big filmmakers of uh, yeah. Burkina Faso. And keep in mind, right, these filmmakers from Burkina Faso, Mali, Senegal, uh, Mauritania, these sorts of filmmakers, they were really. Uh, applauded in, in Europe, in particular France. But then also they were, you know, a lot of them had their training, as you said, in places like Russia. But with them, what was happening was that they were going and they were, they were, they were making these films. And Idrissa Wadrago said this. He said, all our films started to look very similar. We were all talking about the same neo-colonial thing, but the style of films, we were making them, they all looked similar. Yeah. And because they all looked similar, we weren't really getting the progress we wanted in terms of our country. Throw in Tukibuki, inexperienced filmmaker, black exploitation era. So you see like Shaft, you can see the references of Shaft, Sweet Sweet Backs Badass Song, Superfly. You can see the references of all these types of films when you watch this movie, as well as references from uh, influences from Semben and so on. But when you see this film, completely blows you out of the water. You see blood, you see the there's nudity in other films, but it's like a gratuitous nudity. You know, it's like, uh, I say gratuitous. It's just kind of like a complimentary. It's even the movie Zulu. Remember Zulu with, the, with um, Michael Caine, the old movie yeah. made in the 60s. There's nudity. African nudity was almost seen as though, ah, there's nothing sexual about it. Just some women with big flappy breasts. Whereas this guy brought a young girl. She's not like voluptuous, but beaut man, did that girl. Body is banging. Brought this beautiful girl 
uh, not conventionally beautiful, but beautiful. And then she's naked, seductive, blah, blah, blah. You know, the guy himself strips off in the car as they're driving away. You know, he brought some stuff to it that brought, I think, films from Africa, at least that part of Africa, into a more international arena. I, I agree with you, know, you. Because again, when you go back to like the black exploitation era films, they were all kicking off around this time. You start seeing Pam Greer. You understand? Start doing her new, always. New, in fact, there's, there's a movie where Pam Greer doesn't show her breasts. She wasn't in the movie. You know, then you have like the the kind of running scenes reminded me of the Melvin Van Peebles sweet, but even the music, listen to the music. The Paris, Paris, Paris is obviously like a joke. I think he used that more as a funny reference, but the, um, the, the, like he used the funky music towards the end earlier yeah. in the movie. He, he just used music that was more modern. Yeah. So that's why for me, the guy just like the film for me is, 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 but at the same time, though, let me just say this. I was going to say it's brilliant, but his inexperience, you can also see. Yeah. You can see his inexperience. Yeah, I think, I think so. Um, I think, like you said, you know, like he was, he brought a new kind of flavor to that, to the African cinema at, at that point, you know, before it was kind of maybe the slow, linear mm. films of Usman Sembene that were going. But and the, he film, brought and in... the film starts out like that, by the way, when yeah. you see the cows walking. At the, I was mm. like, if you watch that movie at the beginning, you'd be like, this, this movie should not bore me. Anymore. Yeah, exactly. But he he kind of he kind of changed that and brought in kind of the the, 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 the frenetic editing and the, the cut jumping of the scenes yeah. and the intermixing of of music, um, imagery. Obviously, the beautiful landscapes of Dakar and Senegal. You know, intermixing everything. So it's a very magical, almost you know, film. And it, it, it's it's it almost it gives you. It's kind of a film that just makes you. It's 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 it attacks the emotions, the the, the, the yeah. sensory, you know, senses, right? It's, it's it's like I said, it's it's hidden in a lot of symbolism, and 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 you have to make of it what you will individually as a, as a person viewing it. Yeah. But um, that that's the beauty of the film. But yeah, like you said, Paris, Paris, Paris by Josephine Baker. That again is like maybe like a joke, right? Say, look at these guys trying to move, and mm -hmm. you said, you know, look at these two Bonnie and Clyde characters, yeah. this man, this boy and girl who are trying to flee. To Paris, France, um, trying so, to leave the, for for you know or greener pastures <laughs> for greener pastures. Which, which, um, which, if you see films like Mandabi, even Khala, you see a lot of those uh, film, even, and certainly when you watch a lot of films that were made even later, this reference, this concept of wanting to get away from your country and go abroad, start coming back in. I think you've been. Did you mute yourself or did I mute you? What happened? No, I did. I did. Okay, yeah, yeah. So, oh, so, yeah. so there's a lot. There's a lot there regarding. It's it's. I think for its time, it was a very modern movie. I think. Yeah. You know. Um, yeah. And you know, it's funny to see how you know they're trying to flee Africa then and now. Yeah, in the last few years, obviously, we've seen how that's kind of obviously further exploded, right? People trying to flee, but not everyone. Yeah. But um, you know. It's tricky. We don't want to get into too many spoilers, right? So it's tricky to yeah to break it down because you know I was about to really expand on something else, but it's a spoiler. So okay, okay, just, okay. Like, but talk, no, no. What, 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 what which, which part were you talking about? What? Um, it was um the 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 last scene. The I was going to talk about. I was going to talk to you about that actually. So yeah. it's funny. It's funny. I, I still think we should talk about it. <sighs> I think it might be a spoiler to be honest to you. Yeah. No. Okay. Um. Okay, but let's, go. Let's, go. Let's, let's go at it a different way. The ending, and when you watch it, hopefully you, whoever's watching will, will watch this. When you watch the ending, do you... Are you confused, by the way? Were you, were you confused? Um, I wasn't confused. You know, I wasn't confused. You know, it was... Um, no, I wasn't confused. I understood what you were trying to say. In my own, like I said, in my way, I had I took it, I took of it what I thought it meant from the director Mambete, mm -hmm. um, and um, and him, yeah. So again, we can engage in spoilers if you will, but you know, if, if I if I talk further, I'll be going deeper into it. But yeah, I think the yeah. ending was 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 not surprising for me, based on what I was his political views you know because when you look when you look at his interviews you can have a sense of what he thought on you know on, on not just african politics but international and colonial history and and so on and so forth 
Um, but the ending was very interesting for a lot of people, and I've seen a lot of critics have different different views on that ending scene. Um, you know, the beautiful tracking shots. Okay, okay, so 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 okay, we won't spoil it for anybody, but please, I do advise you that you check it out. Let Let's go to the references, the the, because we want to move on in about ten yeah. minutes to the next film, but the references like influences rather of the film you see the film like many of like many things actually 40 years later has more resonance with pop culture you know um fashion you know mm -hmm. you see like in just fashion generally african print whether it's be african print or just african style of dressing see dapper dan that that guy mm -hmm. from harlem who used Senegalese tailors his whole life in the 80s to make clothes for all these like b-boys and all that stuff. He's had a resurgence now 30, 40 years later. So you can see like a lot of this African influence coming back. But with this film, Leo, talk about the influences of this film, the kind of people that have like taken it to the next level. Yeah, I mean, Tukibuki, I mean, it's, you know, it's suddenly come into, into, into mode, into fashion over the past kind of, you know, several years. You know, obviously, you know, led by Scorsese, who obviously restarted the fine prints, you know, with with with, with um with his, you know conservation film institute that he did, and he's been very glowing, um, Scorsese of the film. You know, mm -hmm. he he kind of he considers M Mambetti as someone who kind of jump starts in African cinema. You know, you know, taking over from you know obviously Sembene, who was a different generation than from from Mambete. But I think even you look at people if I, like... If I, if I hold, hold, hold that thought, let's just watch this clip quickly. Yeah. For many years, the common idea of world cinema history in the West was pretty cut and dried. Japan, for the most part, you had Kurosawa, Ozu, Mizuguchi, uh, Russia, Eisenstein, Dovshenko, Padovkin. India was Sajit Ray. And Africa, the entire continent, was Usman Semben. But as the years went by, thanks to the writers and curators and distributors who sought out the rest of the work, this extremely narrow story kept getting wider and wider. In Africa, Semben was by and large the great inspirational figure, I mean, a real father figure. But before him, there was Gadala Gubara from Sudan. And there were other artists who made their first films shortly after Semben, like Suleiman Sisse in Mali, Umaru Ganda in Nigeria, Bed Hondo from Mauritania, and from Senegal, Jabril Diop Mbete. Unlike Semben and Sisse, Mbete had never had any formal training when he made his first picture. He just picked up a camera, started shooting. Papi, papi, papi. He made only a handful of films in his very short life. He died at the age of 54. But each one is very special and has its own unique energy. Tukibuki was made in 1973 for $30,000 and is something else again. It's a cinematic poem made with a raw, wild energy about a young couple who dream of leaving for France. Tukibuki was conceived at the time of a very violent crisis in my life, said Membete. I wanted to make a lot of things explode, and that's just what he did. Tukibuki explodes one image at a time. Yeah, pretty, pretty rousing compliments from the master Scorsese. So like we said, you know, it's it's a film that really shook. And, you know, it's a film that, you know, like you said, now it's come back to fashion. You can see people like Jay-Z and Beyonce posing, you know, in a similar imagery, um, you know, mm -hmm. And, you know, um, so, yeah, I think that's propelled Beyonce into her. Now she's into love, African imagery. Her, her and, black is king era. Yeah, yeah. she's into this era. I think maybe that propelled her, I think. So I think the film is good because I think the film, it hits you, like I said before, it hits you like your senses. You know, it's kind of, it hits the senses. It's, it's almost surrealist, like magical in that way that the imagery um, combined with the the music, um, with, the, with, the, with the editing, and just the imagery is just mixed. A pretty, pretty kind of, um, you know, great experience. So, yeah, we've, we've seen it a lot. So it's actually now, I think it's, it made a list of like 100 greatest films, foreign films, and maybe, I can't remember which mm -hmm. list, but mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. it's, it's been, it's been, um, it's been, and look, there've been a lot of, now it's, it's having a lot of um, new showings and festivals globally, um, 
new yeah. critics of it. Yeah, so it's it's yeah. now it's picking storm, especially now. Yeah, yeah, and it's and it's and it's interesting because uh, you know again Senegalese people have, but Senegalese history is very they have they're rich in like historians. I, I would say comparatively in Africa, they're rich in historians and rich in film filmmakers and of course musicians as well. Yeah. Like they are just, and in football now actually, by the way, Kulibali, Mane, but anyway, that's not, neither here nor there. But they are rich in filmmakers, but the two most prominent ones obviously are this guy, uh, Mambeti and Semben. Um, but they are two almost diametrically opposite in terms of uh, style which is good to have. Whereas when you go to Mali, when you go to Burkina, when you go to all these other places, there's a similarity. You see it now even in like Nigeria cinema, you see it in Ghanaian cinema. See, like this, it's just everybody's samey and safe, yeah. you mm -hmm. know? Uh, interest, interestingly, Mambeti's niece directed the jury prize winning film at Cannes 2019. Atlantics, uh, right? Atlantics. Oh, it exactly, yeah. exactly. So the lineage you can see is already continuing. Um, so which is good to see. Lastly, before we ra ra wrap up talking about uh, uh, the film, just talk to us about the, the guy's career. Like tw two, two feature films in 20, yeah. 20 years, 20, 19 years apart or something like that. Yeah. So like, like we said, you know, he, he did two feature films in 19 years. So obviously he did um, he did um, Tukiboki, then he did um, Aina. Aina, right? Mm -hmm. Aina there. Um, unfortunately, he passed away due to cancer at the relatively young age of 53. But um, yeah, so his career was, was, you know, took a long time, 19 years, 20 years is a long time. And people have different, different kind of explanations for why it took him so, so long. Some say that, you know, he didn't have the funding. You know, we know how hard it is to get funding sometimes in film. A lot of times, some say that, you know, for what he wanted to do, he didn't have the necessary. He had to struggle too hard. He he it didn't feel it was worth it for him because he had to really go up and down. Others say that you know, he had not. He didn't have anything to say at a time during those intervening years. Um, so you have different you know schools of thought on why it took him almost. It took him two decades to to shoot this other film. But yeah, his career is one that we you know, relatively few films, a few short films, like I mentioned, you know, Le Franc, Badou Boy, City of Contrast, um, you know, so, and, and I think it's the, the little girl who sold, um, um, yeah, the little girl who sold the son, I believe. So, you know, all these films are, you know, short film filmography, but yeah. impactful nevertheless. Yeah, so, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but I think I think he was more of an artist than 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 he most. Was. If if others are filmmakers, he's an artist. Like I think for him it yeah. was, and you can see with Tukibuki and uh, even later when he did Hyenas. But yeah, look, I think, I think I think the time the time he made his first film is important. I'm just going through. Uh, um, I think 1973. So just to put it in context, Semben was probably the most active filmmaker we had on the, at least in West Africa at that point. Between 1970s, 19, let's just say 1971 and uh, 1980, he made three films, right? He made three films. Uh, both films, the uh, three films that he made, Mandabi, which obviously did pretty well, Emitai and Hala. Hala, I think, was banned in Senegal for decades or something like that, or at least ban banned either in Senegal or France, one of them. But it was, it was certainly banned by the no, Senegalese government. Um, so I think, as you said, filmmaking in, the, in this part of the world became very difficult for people. Um, I'm sure he would have been given the opportunities abroad to make films. But again, look at what films were being made with black audiences in mind. Again, the so-called black exploitation era films in the States. Other than that, which filmmakers, even in Nigeria, the Afolayans and people like that who were making films, they were they couldn't even the cinema. You start to see declining cinema. You start to see what they call the structural adjustment program with the, the World Bank starting to come. You see the brain drain. People starting to move to Europe, move to America. So you start to see people like the the 
the coups are happening left, right, and center. Maybe not in Senegal, but you know, you can start to see a shift here where any success that you have abroad means that you either try and work abroad, which is still, for the most part, not inclusive when it comes to uh, black people, African people. Um, and then Africa is losing a lot of its, if you want to call it, filmmaking infrastructure. Cinemas are starting to die out and so on slowly. So I think he was a victim of, a victim of his time. Truthfully, I think if he made a movie like that now, he would still find it hard to make another movie. It's just that he would be able to make one with his own money, you know, because he would have, you know, making a movie is much cheaper now. Back in the day, in those days, celluloid, I say celluloid, the film, the reels and stuff like that, tough. You know, whereas if he made that movie now, he wouldn't be, I'm not sure he would be given all the money in the world, but he would still be able to make something else, you know? So... Yep. Uh, Absolutely. So, yeah, so that, that was uh, Tuki Buki. I strongly recommend anybody go and watch this film. Um, you need a strong stomach to watch the film. So just come. If you are hoping to see, uh, 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 you know, the silly stuff that you expect to see in other cinema, I would just say you won't see it here. This is a very nuanced film. All right. So thank you. Thank you for that, Mr. Lionel. Uh, now, we're going to move on to another film, um, which uh, I think I think the best way to know about it is for me to just show you. I saw this yesterday, by the way. Let's, let, me ask you, let me ask you a question, Lionel. Did you see the original Candyman from the 90s? I did not, no. I did not see it. My what sister, my, my sister is in the. Sorry to cut you off. My sister is in the chat. I think we saw it as kids. I don't remember, but I think we saw it as kids. And okay, I saw this yesterday, so it's very vivid in my mind, right? Um, what do you know about this film? Let's start there. This particular film. Yeah this 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 version of the film yeah. Yeah, the, I mean re, the remake because basically it's a remake. I don't know if it's a yeah. remake, but or, or, or no, I wouldn't say a remake. Sorry, it's a sequel to that that one. I don't know if it's deliberate, but it's a it's a sequel to the last one, uh, written by Jordan Peele. Jordan Peele, yeah, who who is a junkie for horror films. <laughs> he is. He I don't is know what easy. I don't know what goes through that guy's mind. That he just thinks <laughs> of horror, horror like this. But yeah, carry on, carry on, and then I'll I'll I'll, I'll talk a little bit more. Yeah, so obviously I haven't seen this this one. You know, obviously this is you know you know this is Jordan Peele's own version. And Nia Costa, by the way, the director, who apparently um, according to you, she did a great job. Um, mm -hmm. Nia Costa, uh, she she's actually directing Marvels for Marvel Universe next. She's filming now, by the way. But um, yeah, I think I think this film, I think I think this film was you know along the line with like you said, Jordan Peele, you know him and his. Is this maybe his new take on, on on the on the series of Candyman films, and I think this has to do with more of the the urban black. I, I don't know if you can expand more on this, Tony, but you know, I, I from what I'm aware is that the Candyman has kind of a um, a certain type of relevance within you know the, the, the black community in in, yeah. in 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 the U.S. and especially within within the, the projects. Um, and for me, all I know about this film was. Jordan Peele has done it again. That's all I can say. I can't speak too much in terms of the film and its and, and, and the tone and the messaging behind it. All I can say is he's done it again. He 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 he, he read it along with a few others. My um, brother, my brother. Let me let me even stop you, my brother. You see, let me tell you the thing. It's funny how these things all have a similar theme. Yeah. Candy uh, Jordan Peele is he's like he's claiming reparations for African-Americans through cinema. So this guy, he first of all started with those comedies, Key and Peele, right? But Get Out. Get Out for me is one of the most pan-African films you will ever watch. You know why? Why is that? All these crazy white people doing all this stuff to black people. All the white people ultimately, I won't spoil it, then the black man comes and survives and he's rescued by his friend, his black friend. That's number one. Uh, is it Us? That was the next one with uh, Lupita. 
I wasn't a big fan of it. In fact, let me not talk about it. I wasn't a big fan of it. But but same same similar theme. Now this film, from what I remember of the original film, and I'll play you the trailer in a minute. From what I remember of the original film, it was uh, um, it was just a black bad guy, and there was some reference to this eighteen ninety kill this killing of this person that came back. And I heard near the cost of the director talking about it. She was like, look, I wanted to explore this, why this guy became a bad guy. How can you just start being a bad guy? You know? And they brought it back. And it's not really until you start watching the film, you start to see that the whole film is trying to tell you a larger thing about black people getting their revenge for a thousand years of systematic oppression from you know, Arabs, white people, and so on. So in the end, the film ends up like, without spoiling it, telling a far greater narrative about what is going on today in America, in France, in the UK. You know what I mean? When I think we can all get where I'm going with this, right? The, the, the common themes that seem to be re reoccurring, you know? And, um, but this is what I will say. The film itself is a little bit confusing, not because... I think it's more to do with the fact that if you haven't seen the, the original, which most people haven't, it didn't really do well at the box office, if I remember correctly, from when it first came out. Um, but it's, it, it wasn't the... the, the you, it's, it's going to be hard to understand certain parts of the film if you haven't seen the original. You know? uh, but Jordan Peele, the point I'm trying to make is Jordan Peele seems to be on this, like path of just telling African and black people's stories and how we can get revenge. He's like a Nat Turner. Do you remember that movie uh, Nate Parker did? The Nat Turner film? What's it called again? Birth of a Nation. Yeah. The Birth of a Nation was a horror film to Uibo people. This film is a horror film that Uibo people can see and it's, and it's a horror film where they are reminded of because it's, it's also a spiritual, you know, the way the film happens, it's kind of spiritual, you know, they've taken it from whatever, because remember the movie that came out in 1992, you had all these ax murderer films, Jason, uh, flipping, what's the other movie? Chucky. It's just the senseless killing of spirits going into a doll, going into a clown or, and so on. And then you had this one black character, this candy man that you say five times, it's very African, folklorish, superstitious type of story, you know? Say his name five times. You see our parents now, you know, don't say anything, don't whistle at night. You know, all these things we used to hear in Africa. Don't, don't snap your finger, don't do this one, you know? And this one is very folklory. So again, it's in that same theme as uh, Tukibuki where we're seeing almost a renaissance. Yes, Child's Play. Child's Play is, is spiritual, Kind of film. If you made that one in Africa, nobody would watch that movie. It's just too gory. But the way they've near the Costa has been able to, and she's a young, she's a model apparently. I heard she used to be a model. The way she just put the film together uh, took Jordan Peele's writing, which for me, everything was on the page. Like it was, you just had to direct the hell out of it, but it was on the page. The way she took what he was saying and then made it into this like larger, uh, much more like inspirational thing with the music, the way the character was shot. Because that Yaya guy, what, what else has he been in? Remind me what else he's been in. Is he, is he a Marvel guy? Does he do any of the superhero films? Um, no, but he's, 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 he's up and coming. He's done a few. He's in the new, he's in the new Matrix. He's going to be in the new oh. Furiosa film, you know, the, with the um, Australian director. And he's been in a few. He wasn't us, actually. So he's been in a few. He's up and coming. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's it. It wasn't us. Yeah, us. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. So, even just seeing him as a choice, like when I first saw the trailer, I was like, like he's too. He seemed to me too masculine, too like you know. But the way they, they the way they depicted the guy's character, he seemed by the end of the film, he, he's just like a little puppy. And then his girl, who at first seems like the little flower, by the end of the film, you see something else. So for me, man. I highly recommend you see it, especially since, like, I think of all these horror movies that are coming out for Halloween or whatever you celebrate, very few of them with African people. So I, I, I highly recommend recommend this film. 
Uh, but yeah, so Jordan Peele, uh, must, 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 a must see. But just so let me familiarize you guys with it, let me just show you the trailer for the original film so that you can see if you can make a link between the two. I heard Candyman. And if you look in the mirror and you say his name five times, in cities everywhere, Candyman. They whisper his name. Right. Candyman. It's just a story. Candyman. Candyman. Just a ghost story. Candyman. An entire community starts attributing the daily horrors of their lives to a mythical figure. The legend first appeared in 1890. He was attacked mutilated and burned to death. Poor Candyman. <laughs> Helen, a woman died in there. Leave it. Everyone knows he isn't real. That's modern oral folklore. Everyone. Except Helen Lyle. Where did I... It ain't safe around here. That don't scare too easy. Don't know about Ruth or Jane? They ain't never gonna catch him. Who? Candyman. Who is that? I came for you. Do I know you? Now she is about to discover. Helen? Get out! Get out! What's behind the mystery? I'm sick. What's behind the legend? Listen, he's under the bed! And most terrifying of all, come with me. What's behind the mirror? He's here. Candyman, you don't have to believe. Just beware. <laughs> You know, don't you miss how they used to do like uh, trailers back in the in the nineties, and that that one guy who always used to talk and do the scary. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I, lo I love it. I love it. But listen, yeah. you have to see this film. If you've not seen it, go and see it now. Uh, the, in terms of blood and gore, I think after you've watched, I think even like the most basic TV shows now have just extreme amount like. Blood is not a big deal anymore, you know. And um, for me, it was it was it's the, it's the moments of suspense that throw you, you know. But um, you know, it 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 just seems to be done tastefully. It's a rated fifteen in the UK. I don't know what that would be in America, um, but it's fifteen in the UK, which means that you know, <laughs> if I was in school, I could have seen it, which means it's not that bad. Um, but anyway, I think I would I would highly recommend that you see it. Um, yeah. So anything else, Mr. Lionel? Anything else you wanted to add about Jordan, about any of the actors in it? No, I just think, I think one last thing for me in regards to Jordan Peele is just, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's fascinating how his, his career has transitioned from, you know, obviously we know him from Key and Peele, um, Key and Peele, where he did all this, like, hilarious and, you know... It, Key and Peele is funny, man. <laughs> very funny and viewed millions and millions of times on YouTube. To ultimately transitioning into this almost this kind of um, guru of horror filmmaking or suspenseful filmmaking in Hollywood, and and him building his career, having a film production company, and having deals with studios, it's been fascinating. You just wonder who else has that talent and who's now really utilizing that, not only in film but generally speaking. So it's it's you know having a kind of talent laying dormant for a while. It's and exploding yeah. out of nowhere it's, it's yeah to me it's fascinating yeah 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 that's yeah. that's an interesting point because the guy is like you know a, a lot of these guys when they get their big break they take it and then they fly yeah. you know and and for him you know he's not a small boy you know yeah he's, he's, he's a big man and when he got his break you could see and it's not just that it's like i think he has an academy award for black clansmen no, no, no. That is no, only for no. writing. It's for writing. It's for writing. Yeah, I think so. And he, yeah. and he produced. He, he produced, yeah. but a nomination for that, you know, as well as uh, I think he won or was nominated for uh, uh, Get Out and so on. Just to, just to segue quickly, just another person whose choices are amazing 
Daniel Kaluuya. Okay. Yeah. Daniel Kaluuya's film choices. So Daniel Kaluuya did Get Out. Did uh, what's the woman? The woman, movie about with Viola Davis when she was going around killing. They wanted to rob money. Rob her husband was cheating on they, they robbed the bank or something like that. Whatever it was. I don't, I don't, I don't recall now. So he was in that one. Not too big a role. Then he did uh, the movie with uh, uh, Queen and Slim. Then he did um, Judas and the Black Messiah. Yeah. What? He's a, he's a really good actor. He's a really good actor. Um, he's a good really actor, good. but it's the choices. De Niro used to say this back in the days. Like, it's, it's, a, the, the, it's about the choices. And then De Niro, of course, went to do movies like Righteous Kill. No yeah. comment. But anyway. <laughs> The, but it's yeah. about the choices. He, he, this guy goes and does these films which are repeatedly African in theme, you know, Pan-African in theme, like bringing our people together, you know, killing a cop, uh, you know, rescue, you know, coming out of this bad situation with this white girl in the suburbs, freeing yourself, um, being the only, the, the, the darker guy in every movie he's in, by the way, and survives every movie. Except, uh, obviously, the one that's a true story. So, look, I, I have props. I give the guy a lot of props. The guy I met, I met here in London, like, maybe like 13 years ago. So he's younger than us. I met him on coming off a bus one time. He had just done a film called Cass with uh, Nonto Anosie. It's based on a true story. Small film. This is when he was doing uh, Skins. And, I was, and even then, you could see the confidence. He must have been about 18, 19. And I'm talking to this guy. Maybe I'm like three or four years older than him. I'm talking to this guy and he's talking, he's, he has this like strength about him, you know? So I was very, 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 very impressed, man. Like he was, he's, he's, his career, again, when you find that moment and you take it and run with it, you know? So props to the guy, props to the guy, man. So anyway, B, we're going to, I think we're going to leave it there. Thank you all for, for coming in. Um, I enjoyed this actually. How about you, Lionel? What do you think? Yeah, it was good. It was good. Um, Discussion on the two films, uh, especially the first one for me. Yeah. Um, that, 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 that really, really um, insightful, really. Just so, yeah, great, great discussion. Yes, for sure, for sure. I think we'll be back, right? We'll be back. We'll do some more. Um, let us know if there are any films you guys want us to, to talk about. But this, is, this platform, I think, needs to be more about promoting African cinema. It's, it's, it's good to talk about the stuff that's current. But me, I'm really about like the films that people need to see, you know, for for from Africa. Everybody sees the American stuff. Um, everybody's aware of the stuff coming out of uh, Hollywood. But then we don't really know what's already come out of Africa. So I think the next film that we do will be hopefully will be a mixture of both, but primarily focusing on uh, classic African cinema. So thank you, my brother. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Cheers. Thank Adi you, guys. Thank, thank you. you all. Thank you Thanks. all for tuning in. Peace. Bye.